I have a problem which I want you to solve. Now, the problem is, how do you introduce a person who has been introduced a thousand times on thousand stages around the world without using all the same words, all the used phrases that sound boring? How can you do another introduction? So I thought, perhaps you could help me. Because I think that our next and last guest, our great finale, um, I think he was visiting a hockey game recently. I'm not sure, but I think he did. So I thought, couldn't we do a kind of ice hockey introduction? You know, you know the, the, the introduction when the speaker or the moderator goes with the first name and then all of you shout the last name. Couldn't we try that one? Is that okay? Really loud, okay? Uh, so instead of using all that kind of uh, the guy who turned the industry upside down, the man behind and so on, I'd say only that I'm really happy to introduce the one and only entrepreneur who actually changed my life. My life. And his name is Steve I hope you don't mind we used Van Halen for the introduction. Oh, that's okay. That's no, it's great. You like that? <laughs> Headlined one of my concerts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You had them but, as guests um, once upon a time. I like I like doing things unusual. So good introduction. Yeah. So I, f I forgot the one first. thing. Forgot one thing. Yeah. I, I I didn't write down notes. I took your book instead. That's fine. a good manuscript, isn't it? That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I put off writing a book, writing a book. I like to live life, you know, and technology is changing, get the newest, latest. I put it off for 20 years, didn't write it until my last child graduated from high school and left for college. So I was all alone. Have you read it? A few of you? It's okay. Okay? It's a good book. It's a good book. It's the real story of the start of Apple. <laughs> <laughs> now, Steve, today is April 21. In uh, slightly more than two months, it's June 29. That is a magic date in your history, June 29. Yes, that was um, Do you the best date I could recollect from my calendars that I sat down and tried a couple of pre-written called proms, chips with some pre-written code to um, allow me to type and would I see it on the television? Was my circuitry correct to put out all the te analog television signals to show the letters? And I typed it that night. I was at my cubicle at Hewlett Packard, started typing in and the letters were popping up on the screen. The significance was the board that I had invented and designed was very few, very affordable chips, parts. So it was finally, so it was affordable. I had a useful computer. You know, eventually I could write a programming language, basic, just like Bill Gates had done. And I did, and I wrote basic, and now I could enter programs for the rest of my life and be happy because you never run out of the next idea for another program. Plus, I didn't have to share a computer with other engineers at Hewlett Packard where I worked mm. on scientific calculators. I didn't have to share a computer. I would have my own. Mm. This was a big, it's, the moment I saw that, that was just total success. But they wonder now, why this weird intro? Well, the reason is it was 1975. It's 40 years ago on June 29. Are you going to have a celebration? <laughs> of that. You know what? I, I pay less attention to man-made artifacts and dates and things like that. You know, I don't even oh, You're understand. a number man. Why do we have... Yeah, I'm a number man. Why do we have months? We should just have the day of the year. It would instantly tell you exactly what time of the year you're in, just as quickly as knowing that it is 
you know, June 22nd or whatever, you know, any June 29th, whatever the date is. Yeah, months were just a phony thing made up. You know, look at, look at how uh, Julius Caesar for July, Augustus for August, Octavius for October grabbed days from February. And why do you count up to 30 and go back to one and start over? This is just okay. nonsense. Okay. Well, one of the reasons we don't have numbers for dates, the number of the year, is you couldn't do it in Roman numerals. And our calendar comes to the Roman <laughs> calendar. So, okay. so we're sort of stuck Steve, with it. Steve, this, this is a designer conference. Mm -hmm. Now I, I want to use a book because I want to analyze with your help how you look at yourself. Because the picture of you is the engineer. The engineer, the image of the, the guy who invented yeah. the PC and all that. Now. I love this quote, if you listen. Page 18, word by word. I wanted to put chips together like an artist, better than anyone else could, and in a way that would be the absolute most usable by humans. That was my goal when I built the first computer, the one that later became the Apple One. Yes, it was actually do, my do goal long before that because I had come up through schooling where there was nothing about electronics, nothing about computers in the schools, and I fell in love with it. It was my passion, and I worked. I had to teach myself. I had to write my own books, and I started designing computer after computer after computer, and I said, how can I be smarter? How can I make it better? I have to compete with myself because I didn't have any classes <laughs> to compete with other students, so I would keep working and working and figure out how to use parts for something they were not intended to be used for, but it saved parts. Every time you save parts, the design became more obvious and simpler and just more correct in my mind. And I had tricks, tricks I had to save parts, and I knew that those tricks, no other, no other engineer in the world would have better ones. So I but, was at but least But did that at the make top. you feel like an artist? Oh, um, absolutely. Oh, I knew it. No, for a certain kind of digital design that was going around in those years, the 70s, oh my gosh, yes, I was an artist. I knew that I was probably ahead of the rest of the world. Even at Hewlett Packard, I had a job designing the hottest product of its, of its era, like the um, iPhone 6s today, and I was designing it without a college degree. They just interviewed me and hired me on the spot, and um, when the PhDs over at Hewlett Packard Labs wanted a circuit improved, and it took them, let's say, 47 transistors, they would call our lab, and I would work on it on my computer for, you know, a couple of hours, and I'd give them back a design with 11 transistors, you know, <laughs> so much. I mean, just, you know, that was just my <coughs> reputation, but it was what I loved being, too. I just loved thinking of myself as, I know all these tricks to use very few parts and get the right things done, and one of the big keys is the architecture. When you define the, the overall product, Define it based upon what the building blocks are, what chips are available and what they do, and then all you have to do is connect them with wires instead of design extra logic to make decisions and do work for you. And that was so I, I used to tell people the reason that I always tried to create things as an engineer with the fewest, fewest, fewest possible elements was because I was too lazy to wire any more of them. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm aiming at in my next question is, of course, the the meeting between engineering and design. Mm -hmm. Can you just say something about I, that? I just, said, I just said a very, very important thing, which is um, it's something that I learned. I was in high school. We had no access to computers. There were no computer books. And I discovered a manual, and it described the insides of a computer. So I, I taught myself over months. How do you sit down on paper with little tiny logic decision making, you know, electronic neurons? How do you make a computer? And I figured out how to do it. And then I started designing them over and over and over. Every computer that I could get a manual from Hewlett Packard, from Varian Corporation, from digital equipment, from IBM, I would design that computer. I, I just got to where every weekend I shut my door and in two days I could design any computer. The Data General Nova computer came out. And it was a very unusual architecture. Instead of having 50 different little instructions to add memories, to move them to certain registers, certain places in memory, to add numbers, subtract, whatever, it had one long instruction and two little bits said, well, which register is one of the sources from? And two of the bits said, what is the so another one of the sources from? And three bits said, are you going to add, subtract, multiply? Are you going to are you going to shift? Are you going to um, uh, shift left or right? Are you going to or and do these logical operations? <clears throat> Whoa, this was strange. I'd never seen a computer 
architecture that way. So I sat down one weekend to design it, and when I was done, it took half as many chips as all of the other mini computers of 1970, all the other ones that were coming out, half as many chips, and I sat down and I said, why? This little thing would have two little bits and it wound up being two little wires in my computer and no smart electronics. And I said, forever in my life, that is my design philosophy. I want to look at the overall design like the architecture of a building, knowing what the building components that you can get, the, sort, the types of lumber and processes. I want to understand it from the parts equaling the total and design the total to use the fewest parts possible. It was just, that was just my principle in life. That was my mantra. But what, what about... Thank you. Good Prince. <coughs> what about... I felt uh, good about it. <laughs> what about the later parts of your career? Uh, interesting meetings between engineering and design? Do you have any more good stories about that? Later parts, well, oh, obviously, when I had startup companies and we'd be working on a product, oh, yes, we would start to work with a lot of product designers that not only understood how to make some mock-ups out of foam or wood, we didn't have 3D printing back in those days, but to make some mock-ups that would look like a shape that was interesting and a style, because that conveys things to the head right away, and it helps a person understand good design allows a person to see right away intuitively, ah, oh, this is what I press to get what I want done, or this is how I use it. And the designers, though, had another talent. They were very up-to-date on the manufacturing techniques for digital electronics. So, they would, heck, they would bring in all their samples and look at the size and the spacing and, and the volumes and, and the areas that you had to fit all your various parts and chips into. Yeah, and I came to appreciate it. I was not that kind of an artist myself, but boy, oh, I appreciated it because it was how you get the final product smaller and more compact. And it's, in my mind, it's just like electronics. It's more understandable, it's more maintainable, and it just it's more precious. I'll try to take another example of why I do think that you were very aware of, of uh, the meaning of design. Can we take a look, Anders, at a picture, a poster, which you will recognize immediately. There it is. Uh -huh. uh, this is from 77, 78 something. And it's, it's, it's for the Apple II, a poster. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication introducing Apple to the personal computer. Well, I remember that ad very well because it was kind of like our first big blown ad ever for the company. And um, where it came from was the design philosophy. We were, um, we had a, the way we started was um, Steve and I, I had the Apple II computer. Steve wanted a company, but we knew it was such a good product. It was gonna be actually all of Apple's income for the first 10 years. We needed money. So we went and we sought investors and we got an angel investor who had been an engineer who had gone into marketing for Intel and he spoke about the importance of marketing. He told us how the look that you give on the outside of a box communicates the idea to the user of what's inside and why you have we to can be keep professional. The a little more. Yeah. yeah, why we had to be professional and everything like that. And he's the one that basically coordinated our advertising. We hired an agency, the Regis McKenna Ad Agency, to create these sort of things, and um, so they, they actually did the beautiful artwork, but he explained his principles of simplicity, understanding everything, and the idea of the simplicity really came from our computer. It was just so, so few parts and so beautiful for doing 10 times more than any other computer had ever done, for, especially in a low price range. So Mike Markla is the person. He owned a third of Apple. We're um, coming Steve to Jobs, him. myself, We're coming and Mike to him, Markla. Steve. Uh, I, just, I just urge you, you could use that today. It's so up to date, this, this poster. Well, it absolutely. Just change. It's like, well, it's like the best songs. You listen to a song from 40 years ago, and it still applies today. <laughs> it's, a, it's a principle, and that's absolutely true. And matter of fact, that's the way that almost every company really tries to think. Some have more luck and more success at it than others, and I would say Apple's been pretty much the ultimate. Yeah. You know, in, in a simplicity about the design is so great. Matter of fact, the iPhone was such an incredibly great product because it's just one flat screen, no buttons. It's sort of like less disturbing things for the eye to even see and interact with. And it's that kind of simplicity. And you got to owe that all to Steve Jobs. He wanted the product for himself so he didn't let everybody else put their two cents worth in and make it complicated. You know, same thing with the Apple II. I wanted it for myself, you know. I even look at things like the Tesla automobile and Elon Musk wanted it for himself and his family. And, uh, and, that's, and everything about it, including the supercharging stations were between his home in Southern California 
and the factory in Northern California, and those supercharger stations are now what makes the Tesla, you know, a viable electric car for everything. More than... But the, the principle is sort of like this ad. The principle of the Tesla is no sacrifice. You drive it just like you drive a gas car. You don't, make, you don't have to make decisions. You don't have to worry about things. It's got enough of a battery. You know? it's, that's a type of simplicity in your life. You shouldn't have to think about technology. More than five years later, I work in a newspaper here in Stockholm, and I want to show you the tractor I used when I was working as a news reporter there. I have a picture on that one. That's five, six, seven years later. Have you seen this machine? I don't recall that machine specifically. Luxor ABC 800. Mm -hmm. That was um, obviously before Apple, though, because it has the big eight-inch floppy disks. Yep. And, um, yeah. I never is used that a them. wonder of design? I never used them. Um, it actually is a very, very wonder of design, yeah. Looking at it, it looks very beautiful to me for what that era was. You're polite. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. The, the keyboard seems to have some good, followable nomenclature. When you, when you consider the manufacturing technology of those times, that's about as simple as you could get something to look. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned Mokula. That's yes. one of my questions. Now we're going over to the founding of Apple, the company Apple, which is in 76. Uh, and let's switch uh, Well, there were the two picture. apples. Yep. There were two apples. One was in 76 and one was 77. Okay, okay. Here's the picture of the one you mentioned. That's 77. That's, That's 77. the real Apple that, that started with the Apple II computer that was going to change the world. By the way, we demonstrated, hadn't demonstrated our Apple II computer that we knew nothing was ever like it. We demonstrated it before we ever shipped an Apple I, which was the first Apple. The first Apple was a little partnership with a hand-typed agreement in a garage, kind of nothing very firm about it, and we transferred the assets of that Apple into the real Apple that was started by this gentleman, Mike Markula. Yeah, he's, he was the investor. He owned a third of the company. He taught us. He was our mentor. He taught us the principles of marketing, of design, of, um, and, and that we would be a marketing-driven company. He even taught us how you set up a technology company. Here are the roles that you hire people in. President, and you have, you have, per, you have um, uh, operations, and somebody has to be handling the books and doing the finance. And he explained to Steve Jobs and myself exactly what each of these roles and responsibilities of these various people were. So he's really the guy who set up Apple. Now you see, but, <laughs> but you never Steve hear about him because he hired an ad agency and their role was to talk about the two young kids who came from nowhere and worked in a garage. It was all kind of like a built up and, story. And, and you, Steve, you seem to it agree. You seem to agree that he was very important in the start of the company. Oh, but more than important. Why, why Mike Marklow was more than important in the start of the company. Yeah. He was, so why uh, is that, that he's so little mentioned, and the focus is so much on Steve Jobs and Party on You? You know, that's the way he wanted it. Mike is the one that took us down to the Regis McKenna ad agency and, you know, helped us. We, we held on to the name Apple Computer. We had to fight them for a while, and we, they selected a logo for us, and they were in charge of all the publications that would introduce us. But Mike Markler really was the guy who ran the company and taught Steve and I how you set up and run a company. Now, Steve didn't have any executive experience, so his role was defined by Mike Markler as being work with everybody at the top level decisions of a company and learn how it's done, you know, which Steve did incredibly well. Mm. Although Steve didn't have any execution successes until he returned back to Apple. He was unable to execute. He could have ideas and vision and, and communicate well, but he was just too rushing and couldn't build the right products at the right price at the right time. If we still stay in that period, 76, 77, yeah, and so By on. the way, what I what? just mentioned was marketing failures. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Barkley, he's the guy responsible for marketing. <laughs> why, why, Steve? Why were you and Steve Jobs such a good combo by the time? You know, um, first of all, we, we brought the different critical elements. I brought the incredible design talents, and I had wanted a computer my whole life. I was going to design, as soon as it was affordable, to build a good computer. I spotted all of the right parts and the pricing coming in, new devices, and as soon as that was possible, I was going to build it for myself. Just no other reason at all. Remember, the Apple I, I gave it away for free at the Homebrew Computer Club, and Steve Jobs hadn't even seen it yet. So I was going to build that computer. The fact that it was valuable 
is sort of an accidental part of history and everybody says, oh my gosh, you, you know, you brought us these things and I'm a symbol because people want symbols, but there's so many, there's tens of thousands of people that did as important and good work as I did from then to where we are now. Um, so I forget what we were talking about, but <laughs> the start of Apple, um, you know, but it was, no, it was, it was, no, it was pretty amazing. We, we thought we were going to change the world quite a bit. Everybody was going to have a use for computers, but the ideas we had in our head of how they would use them in their real life, and this is an important characteristic of design as well, how they were going to use them in our real life, our ideas were way off base. We had no clue to where computers would finally be really successful. It happened by accident and we spotted it when it came. We were out there early, there were no stores, there were no distributor agreements. We could pop into shelf space and multiply our sales by 10 when the right thing hit, which was VisiCalc, the spreadsheet program. So no, we, were, um, we really didn't have a good clear vision. We just knew we had a good product for what it was, but really what it was was a $2,000 typewriter. That's about all it was, but we thought a lot of people are going to want it because it's new and different, and that's the little, you know, the first starter, the hobbyist movement and all that, but um, it turned out it was a platform, and a platform is something that you can add on to and grow, and, and a lot of other people out there, you know, 100,000 great minds, a million great minds in the world can come up with their own ideas and add on to your platform and finally this can make it useful in ways that you couldn't by yourself. Yeah, but Steve and I, we were just, so I was the, I was the inventor totally, um, did all the hardware, all the software, all the construction, all the testing, all that myself. And then Steve just, basically his, his motive, his, the reason we were good, he wanted a company. For five years before the start of Apple, we had a regular pattern. Steve would come into town about once a year and he would see the latest thing that I had created for fun, maybe a video game or whatever, and every single time he turned it into money and we shared the money. So we made a few, few hundred dollars here and a few hundred dollars there because Steve had zero money. That's a good point to remember. When you, are, when you don't have many resources, you are forced to think and come up with ways to achieve with what you have. It forces you. The best things I ever did in my own career were because I didn't have any money myself. We didn't have any bank accounts. We were in our young 20s. We didn't have any rich families. No, we had no money at all. So the best things I did was I had to figure out ways to make things affordable. If I couldn't afford a computer, I had to build my own. I had to design and build it, uh, make it affordable. Um, if we, um, also the best things we ever did, um, especially in my own case, was if I had never done anything before, I had never seen or any disk drive, hardware or software, or worked with one or studied one in school ever. Nothing to do with disks. But I was in a meeting once and I realized if I could build a disk drive that you could type run a program, if I could build that in two weeks, it's normally like a man-year project, I would get to go to Las Vegas with my company because they, would, they couldn't turn me down. If they were going to show off a floppy disk at the CES show in Las Vegas, they'd have to take me, the designer. <laughs> so, I, so I raised my hand. I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? And Mike Markula, our marketing guy, he said yes. Oh, my gosh, in the back of my head, I've got to figure out how, to, how you build floppy disk drives. The advantage was, you know what, it's really good. If you have a good mind, and this would apply to any designer in the audience too, if you have a good mind and you can sit down and think out how should it be, I'm going to write the steps down. I'm going to write my own book rather than reading books on how it's been done in the past. If you have a good mind, you'll come up with a very, very good way. And I came up with an incredible, one of the best designs of my life for the floppy disk. Got it working in two weeks. You could type run checkbook and it would run the checkbook program and I got to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Steve. I want to go <clears throat> so that, I thank, thank you because you know what motivation is sometimes more important than knowledge. If you And I want to go back further in your history now uh, talking about motivation because if you want to be that innovative and energetic as you are you need inspiration. And I've tried to track where you have gotten your inspiration from, from the very beginning. If I read the book again, it's obvious that your dad was very important to you. But I also found another guy whom I think was very important to you. And I have a picture of him. Let's see if you agree. Oh, Tom Swift Jr. <laughs> That's Tom Swift. The and books you can, I read. You can change to the next picture as well. 
And right. tell us all about what Tom Swift, who well, he was, these, and these what are, that meant. These books are older than what I read. This was Tom Swift. I read the Tom Swift Jr. books about okay. his son, and he and his son owned their own company. And whenever there was a world tragedy, he'd go into the laboratory as an engineer, and he'd invent something and solve the problem for the world. Oh, my gosh. M myself, in our neighborhood, it was Silicon Valley was all fruit orchards, as far as you could see, and they were coming down. Little housing developments were going in here and there, and you'd have to ride your bicycle through fruit orchards wherever you went. But half the kids in my neighborhood were, had electronic parents that were moving in to work at Lockheed Space and Missiles Corporation, the only, about the only company in the world that could actually afford these expensive things called transistors and chips. And so, my, so I was one, about half the kids were electronic kids. All the electronic kids in my neighborhood chose to read these Tom Swift books every week, and then all the girls read some books called Nancy Drew, and all the boys <laughs> read these books called The Hardy Boys, but me and my electronic friends, we always liked the Tom Swift Jr. ones because he solved problems with electronics. Oh yeah, it made it very, very important and in my this mind. Was when now, you were... I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that was my big source of motivation. It was certainly something that went along but with my life. But inspiration probably, But yeah. you never know, you have feelings in your side. How did I get to where I got? And you can, you'll look back in your life and you'll find a bunch of steps. But you know what, you're guessing and there's a thing called attribution error. If you feel something inside of you, you'll look around, look around, try to pin it down to some things that you can spot, but they aren't necessarily accurate. Hard to say. I had a huge life of a lot of electronic and a lot of computer experiences, and they all added up to where I got. So, so but that, that book was very important in its day. Man, I remember when I was you know, even seven years old, we, were, we, had, we kids had to get our lights out at a certain time. And there was a street light right outside my window. And I didn't have any drapes. And the street light would shine in the window and land on one place on my floor. So I'd lay the book down on the floor and lean over the edge of the bed and read it. <laughs> <laughs> While I was supposed to be sleeping. Now, those books were, yeah. So what about a few <laughs> words about your dad? Because he also meant yeah. a lot to you. Yeah, I was lucky that I had a father. More than anything else, he was a very good patient teacher in life. He didn't try to impress his values and say, this is how you should be. He would point out the way different people think about things in life and let you choose your own. And I sort of always tried to choose to be kind of in the middle. It's about where I saw my dad. But whenever I had um, an interest in something, like how do you make a transistor make a decision about a game like tic-tac-toe? He would pull out a blackboard, he would explain it. He was so patient over and over. He'd make sure I understood where every electron flowed and he'd help me do something I wanted to do every time. And uh, that, that was a big influence on me, the way I raised my own kids. And I spent eight years as a teacher. I, I, I decided early in my life that I wanted to be an engineer but second, I wanted to be a teacher of young primary students, and I wound up teaching for eight years, kept it secret, no press. No press allowed in there. And it's because I wanted to so badly. But I, I took my, I remembered my father's patience a lot, and I also remembered things like my electronics teacher in high school wrote his own handouts for every class. He didn't use a book and just teach by somebody else's book. He wrote it himself, knowing us, knowing our equipment, knowing where our heads were at. And so when I ran my computer classes, how to use computers for every subject in school, I always wrote my own, my own lesson plans, wrote them in, in the morning, and had them printed on color printers by the time the students arose. So I got a lot of good things from the best teachers of my life, yeah. Now you said that you were a teacher for some years, and in my view, you are obsessed by teaching and learning and studying through your whole life. Yes, I paid a lot of attention in psychology classes to how a child's mind developed. I even, wow, said it's a lot like a computer. Very young infant, will their eyes follow, follow you know, a, a finger or not at a certain number of weeks old, you know? It was like computer development. And, um, but I wanted to be a teacher. The more important thing is I, I knew who I was from an early age on and I liked that person, and I had very strong internal um, moral and ethical guidance, my own compasses. And, you know, when you, you have a big success like Apple Computer, usually, oh my gosh, all you've got to do now is, is work on increasing your wealth and increasing your power and running more projects. And I didn't want to be, I was non-conflict, I don't want to be political, I don't want to push people around and force them to do things my way even. So, you know, so I was able to eventually go back and teach secretly for eight years like I'd wanted to. I thought where I was teaching seven days a week. I mean, it was that important a thing to me. And education and schooling and the importance of it in our lives. And I came around off with, you know, a lot of 
feelings about it, like most people do, pretty negative, you know, and I don't know. I'm hoping that computers would solve the problem with schools and we'd come out smarter, able to think better, not just memorize things better. And computers didn't really have that effect on students yet. So the way I look at it is I'm not going to take today's environment and say in today's environment, now we have all, all of our online, you know, online courses and all that, like uh, Khan Academy. Um, not take what's here today because there's a million other people that could think out and say, this is what we need, this will improve education, here's how it will do it. I, look, I have to look at, I try to look at something that doesn't exist yet because then I'll have my own ideas and I like to be very independent and not strong with other people's ideas. And the only thing I've come up with so far where computers might help in education is if a computer gets conscious and becomes your real true best friend, it might be a guidance guide you and then if we can have one teacher per student someday every student at an early age it's kind of like your third year of college every student can go in the directions they want to go but they can go as fast as they want or they can avoid the ones that they don't like and so I'm, I'm open maybe and I don't know if that'll work and make us think better but maybe it will it's where you know I, I could come someday there's other problems with computers getting conscious though as we all know. Steve, talking more about uh, teaching, you may not know, many of you, that this guy is now an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. Yeah, University of Technology, Sydney. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about professor. that. How, how did that come up? <laughs> they asked. <laughs> Would you like well, to? Well, <laughs> there are so many who ask you. What? There are so many who ask you no, about I've, different I've things. Had, Why did I've you say offers, yes to that? Yes, I've had offers to teach in, in the universities before, and I have a life where you don't look back and have regrets about things. But the one thing once in a while that bothers me is I actually chose to teach young children and I think I could have had a great influence at the university level. I think I would have enjoyed it a lot because university is education too and it's very important. My times in the university were more of my independent thought and, and incredible energies, mental energies and physical energies, more of my own development in computers than any other time in my life. But I've, I've always turned those, those offers down and until now I'm adjunct professor. But that's kind of an honorary. So will you like go there now I, and teach in Sydney? I go there once. I go there when I can, and yeah. I'll speak to students about whatever. Yeah, mm. yeah and absolutely. And I'm, I'm involved with a robotics lab, and, and I believe in robotics so highly. <laughs> I I go and judge high school robotics competitions whenever I can because it's the young students learning that engineering might be an attraction to them in their lives. The way I discovered it with computers and robotics involves so many disciplines. I think a good engineer, a good builder, let's call it a maker, not even an engineer, knows how to work with you know. Mechanical, mechanical parts and motors and the power drive systems and the radio control systems and the microprocessors and the software that makes them all work. They cover so many disciplines and that's really something I believe in, I think. And if you look at manufacturing today, everywhere you go, any manufacturing line, it's got a whole bunch of little robots doing pretty much the same job over and over and the robots are getting smarter. Some of them have vision and can spot mistakes and pull things off the line. And I'll tell you, knowing how to build those robots, the companies that involve materials handling, that's everything from getting supplies to companies to manufacturing on the lines, they have, they're in demand, they're looking for hundreds, some of those companies are looking for hundreds of engineers right now today. So that's a, that's a really good thing to keep in mind if you want to, so if you're in the university and you want many, a job. <laughs> how many similar offers did you get after that, after Sydney? Oh, after Sydney, yeah, I got about 50 offers from universities all wanted, will you be an adjunct professor? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm taking, <laughs> one, is an, one, one is more than I have time for, I'm real busy these days. And uh, well, they, sadly, they, it's not my own university because I did go, I did not have a college degree when we did all this stuff. But, um, but I went back secretly under a fake name and my Berkeley diploma says Rocky Raccoon Clark. <laughs> and <laughs> now Berkeley, Berkeley is the campus that has the most PhDs of any college in the world um, on, their, on their staff and they always give the, the alumni of the year you know, usually it's, a, usually it's a Nobel Prize winner. They have the most Nobel Prize winners on their staff. And usually it's a Nobel Prize winner gets alumni of the year, and I'm going to get it in a couple of months. I'm getting it this year, and I'm so proud of that. <laughs> My proudest. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. 
Because, you know, it, it meant a lot. It's an awful lot. It represents 16 years of your life, you know, at least. You know, to th that degree meant something to me just to tell my kids I have a degree from a college. And normally when you have a huge business success like Apple and, and the humongous wealth and all that, you, you, oh my gosh, you just want to be power driver and make more and more of it and you feel egotistical. And I wanted my degree. I would have had my degree if Apple never happened. So I allowed myself to go back and, and earn it. No, I just... Um, you should know there's a it, really funny TED talk uh, by day. Steve Good. from Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> recently done. Recently, yeah. yeah. Um, TEDx. Well, the proudest day of my life was getting my degree at Berkeley. I always say that to people. You know, I was, was there a couple, a couple of my young kids by then. Okay, yeah. Steve. Um, I have a question about Silicon Valley. Because that's the, the base for you. Uh, this very day... April 21, the Swedish Minister for Enterprise is visiting Silicon Valley because he wants inspiration and he wants to copy ideas and, he, and so on. And you meet regional or national or local representatives all over in Europe and everybody wants to be like Silicon Valley. What's your take on that? Um, yeah, everywhere I go in the world, every major city wants to figure out how can we replicate Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley just had an early start. Everything we have today, the smartphones, the big computers, they all boil down to certain chips that have gotten bigger and with tens of millions of parts, tens of billions of parts on the chips now. And they all date back, those parts, tens of billions of transistors. What is a transistor? I like to describe it as an electronic neuron. The more transistors you have, the smarter a device you can build. The first transistor was invented, and one of the two inventors flew out and set up a, la set up a business in what became Silicon Valley. He set it up in Mountain View, California, Shockley Labs. He had problems building the device he wanted to build, so some of his engineers left and formed another company, Fairchild, to build a simpler transistor. And then other people would spring out. There were spin-offs. These companies would have spin-offs. Today we call it entrepreneurship, and it's even open to young people just out of college. But back then, back then it was only professionals out of business starting a similar business. Silicon business grew up. Who was to know that because of Moore's Law, Silicon and chips were going to be the prime driver of the lifestyle that we have today, the products that we have. Who was to know? But this valley just grew and grew in economic importance and you know, became one of the more expensive places to live in the world and um, among other bad things. <laughs> But I mean, but back to the to the to the question. But everybody question. wants I, everybody from... wants to get there, and I say it has to be it has to grow organically. First of all, you'll have some business successes in a place like Sweden, and those should be praised. They should be noted. Any any efforts to help them even publicize what their story is about. Young people hear these stories and say, "Oh my gosh, ten years from now, when I'm ready, I want to be one of those people." You know. Um, that's, that's very important to do. Motivation, again, is one of the most important factors. Um, but don't just say, oh, what do I do in Silicon Valley? You go to Silicon Valley, and, and most of the people you run into, 43% of the people work for technology companies. And they're always talking about the newest idea and the latest product, and how can I start my own company? And there's so much of that spirit. And that's good for economy. It's good for a lot of startups. But after a while, it just gets boring and away from the life that we used to have. You know, so it, like there's a the, balance. From the region I come from, it's from the Copenhagen Malmo area. They keep on talking about this all the time. We want to copy Silicon Valley. It's yeah, not everybody possible. wants to copy it, but I think it's got to grow up naturally. And I think it's going to spin out of successful businesses. Whatever field they are in, those successful businesses should, um, it's, it's the idea, you should have things set up that it's pretty easy to spin off and do some related product, but a better idea, a newer, better idea. And, um, and eventually, you know, if you have an area that has a lot of these spin-offs and they're successful, then the money follows. The venture, the venture capital built up in Silicon Valley ahead of the rest of the world because there were so many spin-offs of transistor companies and chip companies and new ones, and they were having such success. It just became popular. Let's invest money. We know this business. We know it's going to grow because of Moore's Law. And so we built up this huge venture. And I go to a lot of places in the world and the money just isn't really available for these startup risky ideas where a lot of them fail. I will soon open up uh, the Twitter flow. If you, if you have questions to Steve, uh, Annika will take care of them and we can come up with 
two or three to Steve. Um, now we're changing theme again, waiting for the questions to come in. I read this interview in, I think it was an Australian newspaper, where you talk about the future. And there I suddenly read that Steve Wozniak, the big inventor of the Apple computer, the tech uh, nut, he is scary about the future. More than that, I kind of regret my part in it <laughs> sometimes. Um, Why are you well, scared? Because we're at right a stage right now where everybody loves what technology does. It does what I was brought up. I decided I wanted to be an engineer because I was building products that made life easier for people. And eventually we would have so much free time to do what we want to do. We would only have to work four days a week instead of five days a week. It's really funny, but it went the reverse direction. We were successful, but now it takes two people working stressful jobs full time just to own a home in Silicon Valley, if they can even own a home. So it went the wrong way, but I wanted to make life easier and all that. And now we've got these products. We're mobile. We have it with us anywhere we are. It's like I am so much more powerful as a person. Every time I use a third-party app, you know, somebody made my life better. What would I have done without this app in the old days? It's scary. How could I go, go on with my life if they suddenly cut it off and said, no more Internet, no more phones, you know, no more smartphones? No, we love our products today. They're helping us be more stronger as persons. When I started Apple, I came out of a computer club, and the whole idea was we are going to help people be the masters and be more powerful than ever. The little, the little guy, the, 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 the geek who is nothing in his company, he's ignored, he, he's not even important, is going to take his own computer into his company, type in some financial numbers and turn out some results, and he's going to be a hero. You know, That was important to me to empower people to be the masters of their own fate. And the trouble is, is we get, if the computers ever get, they're getting closer and closer to real thinking. You ask questions like how many mountains are there in, um, in Sweden and, Go and Siri gives you an answer or Google Now or Cortana. You get answers like a brain used to give. So we've replaced a lot of the brain. You used to ask a smart person with a brain a question and now you're more likely to ask somebody whose name starts G-O. It's not God. And, uh, but now, but we're getting closer and closer. We got the machine that, heck, plays a video game and it just, just randomly try different things and try to get a good score and they get better than any human in a matter of hours. And what if they, what if the computers somehow get feelings and real thinking and brains and say, there's a problem in the world, here are the possible solutions and I'll pick and I'll choose the best solution for it, but what if they can think 10 times better than a human? What if they can think 100 times better someday? This is um, all of a sudden, the, what use do we have for our own brains? And yeah, it's a scary thought if that happens. It might be delayed. Ray Kurzweil talks about singularity maybe 20 years from now. I like to say 20 to 200 years because there's a lot of uh, groundwork and infrastructure in the way humans deal with things, even person to person, that can't be replaced with every computer directing other computers what to do. That's, that's sort of the end game that's be very negative. Then we're just what we want to be. We built all this equipment to take care of us, and we don't have to do anything, and it all takes care of us, and we're the family pet. So I started feeding my, I started feeding my own pets filet steaks and <laughs> barbecued chicken when I got this idea, because I'm going to treat them the way I would want to be treated when I'm a pet someday. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, in my, my prediction, it won't be in my lifetime. I said 20, some, some people might say 20 years from now, I say 20 to 200 years. In 20 years, though, it might be illegal for a human to drive a car. See, we're more, every Internet of Things device that we build, we don't talk about just building a little dumb thing that you can check on a, a status of a light at home. We're talking about devices that are smart, like the Nest thermostat. You walk, it notices your patterns and adjusts itself accordingly. What it's doing, it's taking the necessity to think and do things away from the human, but we'll never ever give these devices up. Have we ever given up a human, that uh, a machine that replaced a human? No, we got all the machines in manufacturing, we'll fire the humans, we'll never ever get rid of the machine that gives us cheap clothing, for example. Um, so I'm afraid that the computers might have won, the machines might have won 200 years ago, and we just keep creating them thinking we're creating the stuff that helps us but uh, eventually, yeah, it could supersede us. And that's a scary thought if it happens. Can we control it? We all think, oh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're in charge. We're going to just make the machines, the computers of the future, understand that humans are the most important. You know? And certainly, if we're creating a new species, we're the gods. 
But I do not believe once they're thinking for themselves with independent thought, that goes away. Now, why did I think that everything in the world might be computers talking to computers and skipping the, the people? Okay, the biggest, the way you measure the, the um, progress of the world more than anything else is in dollars, currency, money. And look at the biggest financial transactions of the world. 80% of them are done computer to computer with no human involved. If you put a, a, a slow human in the loop, you lose money. And that made me think, what if a company opens up across the street from Apple doing similar things, but now computers that are thinking 100 times faster than a human, they skip the slow CEOs, they skip the slow <laughs> executives, and that company wins economically, it's all over. Economics always wins. <laughs> And I think economics is just decides where we're going to wind up, not ourselves and our own thinking about what's good and what's bad. Okay, let's hear if we have anything from the floor. Do so we? many questions. Um, Come up with one. Yeah. What kind of hardware, um, hardware product would you like to build and succeed with today? What kind of hardware product would I like to build? Well, if I were actually working as a pr prolific engineer with all the time in the world for it and the focus and no attention on me like I was in certain years of my life, I think it would be probably s the type of artificial intelligence, understanding what people say, but the type that applies to automated cars, cars driving themselves. Um, it just pulls into, into, into so many parts of my life, hardware and software, and everything comes together, and it's a valuable product to people, and it's things that people relate to. It's almost consumerish. Um, I sometimes think that I might want to work on, we've got organic LEDs. I was following them for about 15 years. They took so long to come and finally be in, affordable in products, you know, like Samsung phones, and they glow and they're so bright. But theoretically, that now they can be on foldable materials. You can have your whole display, you know, flexible. And I think, my gosh, if I could have a car that the outsides of the car were like no other car, it was flexible, and you inside could decide what pattern, what pattern is going to show up on that display. And, and you, can have, you can have clear organic LED displays. So you'll see through it to a natural car color that was painted on. But then if you turn on the LED, it glows and your car becomes blue one day and green another day, or it looks like a cop car when you want it to. <laughs> um, that's, another, that's another one I still think has going to come because the economics of the cost for the value are going are to be in place. It's just taking those displays a long time to get larger and to truly get flexible and to get reliable. Okay, we take another one. Will humans be allowed to drive cars in the future? Will humans be allowed to drive cars? I've been telling all my friends and other people that in 20 years, I like to use that statement that I heard somebody else say, in 20 years, humans won't be allowed to drive cars. The trouble is there's a lot of possible truth in that because in 10 years, we're going to have a lot of self-driving cars and humans driving cars, and we're going to have the statistics that with the self-driving cars, they cause so many fewer accidents and, uh, and are so much more efficient for society that we're just going to ban human drivers. That doesn't mean you can't have your nice, beautiful-looking car to show off to your friends, and it's got certain performance characteristics you like, but you'll sit in it, you'll be entertained, and just steering wheel will not be allowed. Um, I, and I do believe that, yeah, for it'll be such huge benefits in terms of the major cost of, ac the major source of accidental death is car injuries. Second is falling and hitting your head but car injury. So I think the, um, the, the results are going to be so dramatic that eventually laws are going to get passed that, that you know, certain roads at first will be self-driving cars only. And there'll be, still be some roads you can go out and have a fun day like walking on the beach. I can drive my car along certain roads and maybe forever. And you can always still drive a car, you know, the ancient cars that you have and that you love and you've had your whole life, you'll be able to keep them, but maybe only on your own property. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of, see, there's a lot of social, social problems in changing something we are so used to over time. But didn't we give up film cameras? It didn't take that long, you know, when there was something new. And we've given, you know, a lot of us have given up newspapers. And so a lot of things of the past eventually go away with the new generation. And, and they're coming up. Uh, the, the millennials, as they're called, the younger people, they're giving up. A lot of them are giving up cars altogether. They don't need a car. 
you know, they'll just use their phone and get Uber and, and whatever they need to get around. So cars are already starting to disappear in the importance I've got to own my own car. Maybe someday it'll just be wherever you want to ride to work, you'll just Uber it and the car will show up. You can decide to go alone or with other people depending on how you feel and, and the car will drive you there. Yeah, it's going to be a very efficient world. And I'd say okay, every car manufacturer in the world, I'm going to guess this, is working on self-driving cars right now. And I could be sure. wrong. There could be a sure. couple that aren't. But I hear one after another, after another, after another. And they're all sure, sure thinking about it because nobody wants to get left behind by the future. Nobody wants to get um, disrupted, let's say, put out of business. <laughs> I heard another one uh, from the floor from two people. So I passed that on. Why by, by the way, the self-driving car why? gives a lot more design choice. Why did you leave Apple? Why did I leave Apple? I left Apple two times. One time I, I was on the Macintosh group and I had a plane crash. I came out of amnesia, what they call short-term memory loss. I came out of that forward amnesia five weeks later and what went in my head was it's been 10 years since my third year of college. This was the last chance I could go back to school and get my degree. The Macintosh group was in very good shape. They had a hardware designer who had been a technician who never went to college, studied every little thing that I did. I taught the technicians at Apple, and he had come up to being able to design with as few a parts as I did, all the same techniques. So I called Steve Jobs, and I said, the Macintosh is in the best hands, the most creative hands. My best friends in Apple are doing it, and it'll be, do fine without me. I'm going to go back to college and get my degree. So I left, I left and did that. And then but when the I came back, time. The okay, second, the second time. time, I came back to Apple as an engineer, and I'm working on some products that became the Apple II GS, the most advanced version of the Apple II with you know color and mouse, you know, same time as the Macintosh. And but then I, um, I got this idea. I like, I don't like big huge companies. I don't like structure. I don't like having to follow a lot of procedures. I like being an inventor. Get an idea, go in, and test it out, and build it yourself, and convince other people of it. And that's more like a startup. I like startups with just a few, a few close friends. Well, here's an idea. Let's go and try it. Let's go make this new thing. And I got an idea for the first universal remote control, and I started a company, and we built it because it was just a small startup. That's what I loved. I remained on the Apple payroll both times when I left Apple, even to this day. I'm the only person who's been on the Apple payroll every week since we started the company. I get a little, it's a tiny salary, but I want to be, it's a token it's to me. It's not huge, sir. And that I almost have no communication with anyone at Apple ever, but they um, invite me to the to top events. They don't forget me, but boy, they, they don't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> one, one year after Steve Jobs died. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and that, means, that means a lot to me. One year after Steve Jobs died, my wife was working for Apple Education, and she went on the internal computer at Apple, and it said that I was still reporting to Steve Jobs, so I said, good, I can't be fired. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, uh, you have underlined many, many times in your life, in the book, that it's important to have fun. So I have a couple of questions which are on the theme of, is it really true that? For example, is it really true that you, as a young kid, decided to call the Pope and almost got through. Yes, I built a device that could make free phone calls anywhere in the world based on articles I'd read, research I did with Steve Jobs. Oh my gosh, and I designed it. Steve Jobs never was an engineer. He couldn't design anything. He couldn't write software. But I designed it, and this was before software. It was all hardware. And it could make free calls, and Steve Jobs, we were showing it off in the dorms in Berkeley, and Steve Jobs, because we, we, we told our parents what we were doing. It was a principle of mine. To, if, even if I do something illegal and wrong, I will tell my parents what I'm doing. So they'll, they'll trust me. The parents, our parents both said, don't use our phones. <laughs> so we're in the dorm. We're in the dorm, and Steve says, we could sell this. What? We could sell it for 150 bucks. That was a lot of money in 1971. $150, it cost me $75 to build them, you know, just for, you know, the few little chips in it. And uh, so we got in business and we sold them. But every time we did a sale, we'd arrange with a group of people that we thought were kind of cool, not going to turn us in. They weren't the, the police-minded type people, you know. <laughs> we'd, we'd give a demonstration at night, and we always for had them recording it. And so one time we were in this one guy's dorm room trying to demonstrate the blue box so we'd get a sale. And I just thought of calling calling Italy inward, asking for Rome inward, and then asking for the Pope, and they said, well, it's 5.30. I said I was Henry Kissinger. <laughs> I, said I, was, I said I was calling on, I was with Richard Nixon at the summit meeting in Moscow that was going on. This is early 1972. And you and sounded I, like Henry Kissinger? No, I didn't sound like him at first. 
Okay. And then they said, the Pope, uh, it's 5.30 in the morning here. Um, I said, I'll call back in an hour. So I called back in an hour. I used a little bit of an accent the second time. You know, I wanted to sound like maybe I was Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and, uh, and so, oh, I got up to the, talking to the bishop who was going to be the translator. And he said, I just spoke to Henry Kissinger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I have another one. Is it true? But there is a basic uh, check, fact control first. Um, this is a favorite question I got from a girl who works in an Apple uh, store. I said, you've got to ask this. Do you happen to know a man who's called Evets Kainzov? <laughs> um Evitz Kainzo, I have had a lot of fake names in my life. We just brought out one, Henry Kissinger. I'd forgotten about that one. And I was doing blue boxes, so I was Berkeley Blue. Well, when the Game Boy came out in the United States, it shipped with a Tetris game. I didn't know what Tetris was, and I was, wasn't going to play it. And my young son told me what a Tetris was, how you get some points. And I started playing it with friends, and, and I was getting higher scores than them eventually, and getting real good scores. Nintendo Power Magazine publishes the high scores in the United States. So I would send in my photographs. You had to take pictures and mail in a photograph of your high scores. And I was always at the top of the list, month after month after month. And people were kind of well behind me. I was like number one. And finally, Nintendo Power Magazine said, we're not going to print your name anymore because we want new people to have a chance to get their names in. And then Evitz Kainso so comes in. I, so what I did was I, I spelled my name backwards. Steve became Evitz. Wozniak became Kainzow. So I sent, it, I sent in my score as though it were from Evitz Kainzow. And I said, if I send it in from Los Gatos, California, my city, they'll think it's the same city. They'll, they'll, they'll catch me. So I used the next city over, Saratoga, California. And there you was on top of the in. list. Well, here's the problem. The next month when the magazine came out, I had forgotten that I had done this. I had a lot of things going on in my life, teaching classes. I'd forgotten I had sent it in. And I pilled, grabbed the Nintendo Power magazine. I flipped to the page on Game Boys, and I saw a name at the top, and it looked foreign. I said, oh, it's a foreigner. And, th <laughs> and then I said, Saratoga, California. Oh, my God, the next city over. I got chilled. I was scared. And then I remembered doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, <laughs> and okay. I actually have a copy of that. So magazine. it was true. So it was true. It's true. I have a picture of you when you were having fun. Can we show that one? There. Yeah. You're a real Segway fan, aren't you? Pardon? You're a Segway fan. I'm a Segway fan. It's a big part of my life. Um, when it came out, it was going to change the world by being local, low cost transportation like bicycle racks are now. It didn't go over that way. But to me, it's enhanced my life because if I want to go into town, for entertainment, for dining, for shopping, all the normal things. Hop on my Segway in the, in, the, in the living room, go right out the door, go down, I'm in town, I go down the hill and I'm in town in 10 minutes. I'll park my Segway at the, inside the movie theater and watch a movie, and then I'll ride the Segway back home. It's so much more pleasant than a big, huge car. It is, it's almost like I get to ski, in, to ski into town whenever I want. I also carry, my wife and I carry two Segways in the back of our car. For 10 years, I drove a little Prius it had all five passengers plus two Segways. So we'd stop anywhere, a new city, we'd like to drive a lot, go to a city we've never been in, pull out the Segways, and we'd zip around and learn that city so well because it's, you can't walk enough to learn a city, and driving, you're just looking at streets and you don't really get the landmarks and the layout very well, so that's a big part. And we play Segway Polo. Right now, the Segway Polo Championships, there's one going on in... Um, You're actually playing? The, the, you I are playing the Segway team, Polo? The Swedish team often wins um, the, the World Championships even. They're, um, they're real good. As a matter of fact, on a bet, I lost um, one of the first iPhone 4s, I think, I had with me. And I lost it to a Swedish player because I didn't think they'd win. I bet them, you have to win. <laughs> they did. <laughs> um, no, it, it started out, Segway Polo is a sport that's a lot of fun, like you think it would be hitting the ball and getting through loops. We do, our team in California, the Silicon Valley Aftershocks, defined the rules of the game at first and the, the, the equipment of the game and a lot of court sizes and things like that. Then we, play, we got five teams in California, and then we played a team in New Zealand a couple times. And then there was a World Championships in Cologne, Germany, and Barbados won it that year. But now there were a lot of European teams. We in California were nerds. 
We don't play that well. And uh, the rest of the world had athletes, and they were really superior. <laughs> so uh, I think last year's was in Washington, D.C., and it was sponsored by the Lebanese team. They wanted to do it in Lebanon, but they said our Jewish members would get killed. So, so we did it in Washington, D.C., and this year it's going to be in Cologne, Germany. I think it's this um, July, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to be playing for a German team. Because the California teams have That's kind great. of filtered to great. almost nothing. Steve, we're soon gonna gonna wrap up our conversation, but um, I want to show one more thing because this this uh, this session has really been about doing it the was way, isn't it? And there is a was way. I want to show that picture here. Ha <laughs> ha. San Jose, California. So I'm tell so the story that. behind that. Alrighty. The story behind that is I never started Apple for to get wealthy or to make a lot of money. And so when I had a huge wealth, I put it into the city I was born in was San Jose, California. And I put it into starting the Children's Discovery Museum and the tech and the, the Silicon Valley Ballet and, and sponsoring the um, Philharmonic Orchestra and all that sort of stuff. And the city just decided they had this new street. It's an important street, actually, and they, they named it Waz Way. What a cool name. You know, it is. It yes, is. that's sort of, I also, I've also had some success <laughs> with um, the Hard Rock Cafe actually created, in, in South Lake Tahoe, created a pin of me on a Segway playing my, my Apple II like it's a guitar. <laughs> that's sort of equivalent to having a street named after you. It's a, and it's a great important street, and the Children's Discovery Museum is on that street. It's yeah. great. It's not so far away from where you, where you live. Um, no, San Jose. No, I, no, we live in Los Gatos right next to San Jose. Yeah. 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 So you're next to it. We're down there That's all the great. time. Yeah, for, for music and stuff. Actually, though, concerts. San Jose never had the cultural fee thing of San Francisco. So all the little concerts, the little groups that come and play in bars and, and smaller places. I don't like to go to the huge concerts anymore. Did that my whole life. So my wife and I will always drive an hour up to San Francisco, you know, just to see some little group we heard on the radio. Very important to yeah. us, music. Now... You've been asked already, we're going to do that now, to sign an iPad. Okay. Uh, because it's going to be used for the UX Awards this fall. So I want to ask uh, Pia Kari Nokeson and Johan Bernson to come up on stage. And with the iPad also, to sign that. And uh, you will tell a little about the background as well. The background I of think. the... Yeah, uh, so you won. Yep. While you sign what? it, Steve. The only thing I can tell about an, an iPad is they're coming gold, silver, and space gray. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of like from signing so many. I kind of like the gold, actually. That's sort of my preference. My little iPad Mini is a space gray. I call the iPhone 6 Plus an iPad Micro. <laughs> any of you? So, but no, the, no, just the beauty of the styling. It's just. Perfect. It's what a computer should have been all along. You, but you know what? We didn't have the technology to make computers that small and tiny. Usually, the smaller you can get things, the better. But we're going to have that's going to get tested with the watch. Here's a small thing. Here's a <laughs> Flick wireless smart button, which you're going to get as a gift also. Ah. Oh my god. You can goodness. control almost anything. It's really scary. Oh. <laughs> the button. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's beautiful. And here's a little candle cube also. A candle uh -huh. cube with a special design, Swedish glass, wow. is it? Now, that's all. Uh, oh should God. you explain Very why precious. we do this, Yuan? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Is, is anyone eager to have this? Is anyone? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So this comes with, with some kind of investment. We've heard so much today about meaningful, beautiful, like great user experiences. And, and that's something that we all have in, coming, in common, trying to create those. That's right? So last year, it was the first just year stay, for the in-use UX awards. And uh, we had a great winner, the ES ESET Nils Kollen. It's a really, really great uh, web uh, application. And we are so much wondering who will win this year's competition. And the prize this year will, of course, be um, this iPad together with uh, uh, some of money. So from Friday, you can check uh, inuseuxawards.com and you can nominate whatever solution you want. And maybe this iPad will be yours. Thank That's you. great. That's great. OK, thank you. Good. You want to add something? I don't something? get to select no? the winner. <laughs> Pierre Corrin? 
No, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming here. It's been just a pleasure as last year. And uh, thank you so much, Steve, for coming all this way. Can I ask so the delightful. crowd to deliver a standing ovation to Steve uh, Wozniak? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very funny. much, Steve. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, everybody. Great. Look up there. Yes, my honor. Good yeah. to have you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep things going. <laughs>